Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter has added a surreal twist to the annals of corporate history, characterized by peculiar legal tussles that rival the most intricate of fictional dramas. While Musk's acquisition of Twitter might be deemed a personal quagmire, it appears to be a boon for those who find amusement in the labyrinthine world of legal disputes. Musk has recently launched a lawsuit against the renowned law firm Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Amp Katz, which represented Twitter during the tumultuous negotiations that culminated in the acquisition. Musk's primary grievance revolves around his contention that Wachtell overcharged Twitter, a cost that now falls on his shoulders as the owner of the social media giant. The saga is far from straightforward. At its heart, it's a story of a public company, Twitter, and an individual Musk who aimed to privatize the company. Musk initially offered Twitter $54.20 per share, which was accepted by Twitter's board. However, Musk later sought to backtrack on the deal, presumably realizing that managing Twitter was a much more complex endeavor than merely composing his usual tweets. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button and the notification bell to stay updated on our daily videos. When Musk decided to renege on the deal, Twitter turned to Wachtell, a prominent player in mergers and acquisitions. They initiated a lawsuit in the Delaware Court of Chancery, which compelled Musk to adhere to the original terms of the agreement. In this fiercely fought legal battle, Wachtell emerged victorious, effectively forcing Musk to complete the transaction without any discounts or amendments. It was a significant win for Twitter in the legal arena. In the hours leading up to the deal's closure, Twitter paid Wachtell a staggering $90 million in success fees. Musk now contends that this amount constitutes unjust enrichment. To comprehend the intricacies of this legal drama, it's crucial to examine the timeline in greater detail. Twitter retained Wachtell on June 21, 2022, under an initial engagement letter that stipulated hourly fees for litigation. Notably, this document did not include any reference to a success fee. The engagement letter did highlight that Wachtell had negotiated a 15% discount on hourly billing rates for Twitter, signifying a commitment to cost savings. Over the ensuing months, Wachtell billed Twitter for a total of $18 million, inclusive of $15.6 million in hourly fees. Musk finds this amount exorbitant, given the relatively short duration of their services. However, it is essential to consider that during this period, Wachtell initiated a lawsuit against Musk, effectively coercing him into moving forward with the acquisition. The lawsuit was filed on July 12, 2022, and by October 4, 2022, Musk had surrendered his efforts to backtrack on the deal and decided to adhere to its original terms. The transaction's closing was scheduled for October 28, 2022, marking a turning point in the proceedings. According to Musk's complaint, on October 27, just a day before the deal closed, Wachtell made an audacious move by demanding a $90 million success fee from Twitter. This request came despite the fact that the merger litigation in Delaware Chancery Court had already concluded. With no foreseeable need for further legal services from Wachtell, Musk alleges that Wachtell sought and secured a success fee that amounted to nearly six times their $15.6 million invoiced hourly fees for a relatively brief period of work. Notably, this success fee was not specified in any previous agreement with Twitter. One might wonder why a success fee would even exist and why a company like Twitter would consent to such an arrangement. Success fees are typically introduced to align the financial incentives of the client and the law firm, ensuring that the law firm has a stake in the outcome of the legal matter. By tying compensation to successful outcomes rather than hourly billing, it's believed that law firms are less likely to engage in unnecessary work or overbill clients. Wachtell's practice of linking fees to the value of successful deals, as opposed to hourly billing, is an approach that distinguishes it from many of its peers. This approach mirrors the fee structure employed by banks, which earn a percentage of the deal's value upon its completion. In essence, the legal wrangling surrounding Musk's Twitter acquisition is a testament to the intricate and multifaceted nature of high-stakes mergers and acquisitions, where even the most minute details can result in substantial financial consequences and legal disputes. Musk's pursuit of a substantial portion of the success fee, which Twitter paid to Wachtell, highlights the importance of clear and comprehensive legal agreements in such transactions, as well as the intricacies of success fee structures in the legal industry. But Musk's argument against the success fee, while intriguing, is not without its flaws. He claims that the legal services provided were not particularly challenging, characterizing the dispute as a garden-variety contract dispute. 
Musk points out that there were no novel or complex legal issues involved, and the litigation did not demand special skills beyond what other reputable law firms with experience in Delaware Chancery Court litigation could have provided. Interestingly, Musk's argument takes an ironic turn, as he essentially acknowledges that the legal questions were straightforward, indicating that his attempt to back out of the deal was legally groundless, making his litigation frivolous. Musk's position becomes more tenuous when one considers that if he had simply adhered to the original agreement and consummated the deal, Twitter would not have had to pay a success fee at all. The Twitter board, in particular, would have been satisfied with Wachtel's role in closing the deal at the initially agreed-upon price. The deal's closure at $44 billion suggests that the success fee amounted to approximately 0.2% of the overall transaction. From this perspective, one could argue that the success fee was a prudent financial decision for Twitter, potentially saving the company a significant sum of money. Success fees are not uncommon in mergers and acquisitions, and it's worth noting that Musk's own law firm, Reed Collins and Amp Tsai, handling this case, also charged success fees. However, Musk posits that the success fee is unconscionable, particularly as the firm's work had already concluded. In his view, it's unjust to enforce a contract that effectively results in an additional $90 million when the work had already been accomplished. Musk's argument hinges on the legal principle of consideration in contracts, which pertains to the benefit that each party receives in exchange for what it gives up. Gratuitous promises, akin to gifts, are typically unenforceable in contracts, but the promise becomes enforceable when it involves a reciprocal exchange. In the realm of modifying existing contracts, new consideration is generally required for the modification to be valid. Consideration can vary in size, but it must reflect a mutual exchange between the parties. In legal circles, there's a famous teaching that consideration can be as trivial as a single peppercorn. Although in contemporary legal discussions, this often serves as a metaphor for something of minimal value. Musk's contention that Wachtell could not amend the original agreement without new consideration is a point of contention. In the original fee agreement, Twitter had consented to pay the law firm for services billed on an hourly basis. At the 11th hour, Twitter acceded to paying a $90 million success fee. Musk argues that such a modification was possibly improper. As fee agreements should clearly outline the services the law firm will provide, the fees to be charged, and an estimate of expected expenses. Musk's point is that Wachtell could not alter the initial agreement's terms without providing new consideration. Wachtell's potential defense rests on the idea that they weren't altering the terms of the original agreement, but instead engaging in discussions about comprehensive fees related to both litigating and advising on the deal. Under this perspective, Wachtell might assert that their role in litigation was completed, as Musk mentioned, and that they needed a new agreement to compensate the firm for their advisory role during the deal's closing. While this argument has validity, we lack insight into Wachtell's true intentions and the old Twitter board's viewpoint. Furthermore, consideration can encompass almost anything of value, and it's only deemed inadequate if it holds no value whatsoever. Musk's argument may hold ground within the confines of legal technicalities, but the larger narrative is still shrouded in uncertainty. Musk further alleges that the success fee violated the ordinary course covenant within the merger agreement. He suggests that Twitter employees, including the outgoing board of directors, were engaged in corporate sabotage. The complaint implies that Wachtell took advantage of the situation, effectively lining their pockets with company funds during the transition to Musk's ownership. However, it's worth noting that Twitter had to engage Wachtell's services precisely because Musk had attempted to rescind the merger agreement. Musk's assertion that they shouldn't have approved the fee, in part because he had no intention of paying Twitter's existing bills, is based on the premise that Twitter should have adhered to his directive to cease all payments on the day of the closing. Musk's directive was meant to ensure that he had the opportunity to scrutinize payments as the new owner. It's important to recognize that Twitter's executives weren't legally bound to follow Musk's directive until he officially took ownership of the company. Therefore, Twitter paid the fee just moments before the deal's closure as Musk moved forward with the acquisition. Musk contends that the timing of this payment is suspicious, insinuating that it was orchestrated to keep the payments discreet. While Twitter's executives had little incentive to minimize the law firm's fees, they also couldn't be certain that the deal would materialize until the actual closing date. If they had made decisions that significantly drained the company's resources, they would have jeopardized their own positions should Musk have chosen litigation over closure. They'd then be saddled with managing a company hampered by imprudent financial decisions. Additionally, Musk's history of contentious financial disputes 
and his reluctance to fulfill financial obligations could cast doubt on the strength of his argument. Relying on a personal history of breaching contracts may not be a robust legal foundation. Musk might have been on more solid ground if he had refused to proceed with the sale due to the $90 million success fee being outside the ordinary course of business. Yet famously, he pressed forward with the deal, paid $44 billion, and now owns a company valued at a fraction of that. In conclusion, Musk's challenge against the success fee rests on intricate legal arguments and contractual interpretations. His contentions raise questions about the propriety of modifying the fee agreement without new consideration and the ethics of demanding an additional $90 million in fees for services that were largely concluded. The success fee's validity, or lack thereof, will ultimately be determined in the legal arena, where considerations of legal precedent, contractual obligations, and practicality will weigh heavily in the verdict. As this legal drama unfolds, the full breadth of Wachtell's perspective and the old Twitter board's rationale may provide clarity on this complex matter. For now, we await further details and insights into this extraordinary corporate saga.